all your data, as long as you want to be getting a virtual medical coach, all your data will be continually inputted and assimilated and fed back to you in terms of guidance. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we get the text part straight, it'll also be the entire medical literature pertaining to you. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are on site at Scripps Research Translational Institute in the beautiful Torrey Pines, California. We are now going to be talking about deep medicine. We have Dr. Eric Topol joining us on the show. Hello. Great to see you, Alan. Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. It was, you did such a great job on Sam Harris's podcast, and I was really grateful that so many of my friends have been constantly pushing me. They're like, have you had Eric on the show yet? Get Eric on the show. See if you can make it happen. So you have a lot of fans around the world that are that love your work. And for those that don't know, Eric's bio. Eric Topol is a world-renowned cardiologist, executive VP of Scripps Research Institute, one of the top 10 most cited medical researchers, and author of several books, most recently, Deep Medicine, How AI Can Make Healthcare Human Again. And you can find all the links in the bio below to Scripps profile page, Wikipedia page, Twitter, as well as the link to Deep Medicine, the book. All right, Eric, let's start things off by asking you, what are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Well, Alan, it's a big question, a lot to unpack there, but you know, I think of it as in the world of medicine and life science, and I'm really excited about it. I think that we're on the cusp of a real extraordinary, unparalleled time. Uh, it's very much in contrast to some of the other problems we're confronting, but this is largely because we've been accumulating data uh, up until recent times, we didn't know what to do with the data. And of course now, um, with deep learning, machine learning, and these different types of artificial intelligence, we're gonna take this to a level that I think many of us uh, might not even have envisioned happening more quickly than what I think uh, even some of the most optimistic folks uh, could have foreseen. So having been a student of medicine and in and, and life science for a few decades, this to me is, is really enthralling. I'm excited to unpack the nuance of it with you. One of the things that is so important is having structured data. That's one of the most important things. And the other one is having the stream of relatable biometrics that we take from the body actually be effectively processed to predict pathologies, to augment our health, all this type of stuff. How do you foresee that most effectively happening? Well, first on the, the structured data is really a, a limitation today because that works really well for images because using algorithms to discern and interpret an image, it's already a structured um, substrate. Uh, it's a perfect input. Uh, it's speech as well. But when you get to text, that's where you start to see a drop off because a lot of text is unstructured. And we're just starting to see a turning point there. There was this really remarkable work published in Nature on material science, where with unsupervised learning, being able to start to uh, get these embedded texts and trying to recognize text. But right now, that the idea that like, for example, IBM Watson put out that a doctor could read 5,000 articles uh, and then go see patients. Well, we're not there yet because most things that are published in the literature are uh, unstructured and you still need uh, um, ability to read and comprehend. We haven't got machines there yet, but that's kind of the last of the three uh, with images leading the charge, speech not somewhat behind, but not that far behind, and then text is, is certainly the one that's uh, trailing. Now, the other thing you asked about, which is about... The biometric stream being most effectively pre for predicting the pathologies and for augmenting our health. Yeah, I mean, th this is an explosion of being able to, well, f interpretation, classification is really sharp. And again, that's relying on a lot on images. What we don't have so well, um, really, is prediction. And when you look at it, you know, we, we got a lot of uh, shots on goal with, we'll predict the person is gonna live in the hospital, or they're gonna re be admitted from the hospital. 
Um, perhaps actually the best uh, paper on prediction study just came out recently. In fact, I had the privilege of writing the editorial for Nature. It's only the second paper that's been published in Nature for AI in medicine. And it was about kidney injury. And it happens very frequently in patients in the hospital, one in five, which is alarming. Mm -hmm. And it's a big deal because if somebody has significant kidney injury, they could go on to requiring dialysis and possibly transplant or even dying. So we want to be able to predict it because those are the people that we want to have exquisite control of their fluids and their blood pressure and what medications or contrast dye, all these different things that could happen to them. And so uh, since we have this very high prevalence of one in five, if we can get that down to you know one in a hundred, it'd probably never be perfect. That would be exciting. So that's a more uh, granular prediction rather than is someone going to die or not and that's the first time we've seen organ injury prediction but it has to be something that's actionable so one of the problems we have is we got these things that are prediction like Alzheimer's well okay but what are you going to do about it mm -hmm. so that is an issue today is we're being able to predict things it's fuzzy it's not as nearly as high in accuracy as an image interpretation but uh, it's Obviously, a lot of work's going into it. Most of the work is retrospective going backwards yeah. in computer data sets that are all pristine and assembled and the data are all cleaned up. They're not in the real world, prospectively, where you're trying to make predictions and seeing whether they really come true. So that is a more challenging thing and, and very few prediction studies fit into that group of going forward. Uh, and that's what we desperately need. Eric, what would you say is the what some of the, some of the most important uh, principles and skills for us to embody for keeping our homeostatic capacity in the youthful state for as long as possible to increase our longevity? Yeah, well, that's a great question, Alan. <laughs> if we knew, you know, <laughs> that'd be fantastic. I wish I knew. Uh, you know, I think that. We're learning about this. Um, there is, a, of course, a big boom in, in the science of aging and learning the biology, which we didn't know about even you know, a few years ago. I think turning that into commercial entities is troubling because they are often way ahead of where the science or the, the proof lies. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, one of the things that's exciting to me is this food is medicine story. Yes. Because if we could eat what we eat, if we were using that instead of medicines or augmenting effects of medicines, that, I mean, that would be ideal. And we're just chipping away at that now. So that, to me, is one of the signposts that we're really making progress. So whereas up until a few years ago, it was just everyone should eat the same diet and we don't have any real mm -hmm. good story. In fact, we don't have data to back that up. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the studies in nutrition have been very shaky. Uh, most of them are not randomized trials, they're observational, so they have all sorts of uh, issues of limitations. And so we've been left in the lurch and we've had guidelines and food pyramids and they're all really basically, you know, kind of a cockamamie mess, you know. No one knows what really they should be eating. Lots and of perverse incentives too. Yeah. Fake foods and we can get a little into the fake physicians as well, but just perverse incentives all around in lack of inclusive stakeholding so that I used to give you food for your optimal health because it would also help our tribe's health and whatnot. And now it seems in many ways that we deliver food for self-dealing purposes so that I can earn more money no matter what the quality of food is. And similarly with a physician that is potentially get, getting a little bit of under the mo under the table money for things that the patient doesn't need, and that when there's a lack of inclusive stakeholding between the outcome of the patient as well as the physician, and these time blocks are whatever twenty minutes to see a patient, and there's the, the electronic health record and the keyboard, the focus on that instead of that deep empathy with the patient. I mean, there's so many of these variables that we need to really figure out what is most optimal for healthcare. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we know that a diet is 
is part of that story. I mean, obviously, exercise is part of it. You know, being at the right weight and being fit is is important. But the diet part has been the the zone of uncertainty. And what's changed there is that using AI, we've cracked the case that each person has a very unique individual response. And in fact, even identical twins are very different. And the mm. reason for that is partly because of the gut microbiome, which yeah. has just blossomed in terms of being such a big player in t t determining our health. But also, you know, all these other factors like, you know, your, your physical activity, your sleep, your stress level, uh, your medication. So once we get all that data on each person and you have a glucose sensor on, you can find out what foods are the ones that are driving, if you have any, which is not uncommon, these very big spikes in glucose, which are undesirable. We don't know fully in a healthy person who has glucose spikes. We don't know the long-term significance of that and whether we should do everything we can to prevent them, ablate them, or at least reduce them. And now we're also seeing the same with these triglyceride spikes. So the point being is that although we don't have outcomes to say, oh, well, if you eat these certain foods for you, this, this is your, Alan, your personalized, individualized diet. If you stay on that, that will prevent cancer or heart attack or autoimmune disease. We don't have that yet. What we have are these intermediate markers like this is your glucose. And if you stay away from these certain foods, and, and shift more to these, you can keep your glucose flat or you can keep your triglycerides flat, and that probably will translate over time. But the point is, we didn't even know that a few years ago. So we're making progress. It's not a commercial story yet, in my view, but maybe in the next few years, it, it may start to be. Um, so diet is, is a biggie, um, but I think in terms of the aging process, uh, for the most part, um, it's very difficult to affect that. Um, you may have some soft modulation, but um, you know, we don't know anything that really is, you know, there's been all these false starts. There was resveratrol and there are all these things that were to affect a person's, uh, and people just obviously, they, they, they cryotherapy. Mm -hmm. I mean, all sorts of things, and none of them have actually the science to back them up in people. And in a mouse, you can do almost anything and get them, you know, mice to live longer. So that is not a representative model mm -hmm. for humans. Are endeavor into more precise personalized medicine and nutrition is huge and also the serious amount of of data we're now having from the microbiome and it is very complex to figure out how to keep humans healthy for as long as possible yet that is one of the most important things because as we get older, it's like we have a library and that we want to keep adding books to the library and see the new connections that are made, the new creative potential that can arise later in our lives versus like what happens in neurodegeneration. It's just like the library gets burned down. And, well, you know, you're bringing up a, a key point and it relates to this whole deep medicine uh, umbrella uh, concept. The point is where we're gonna go is that all your data, as long as you want to be getting a virtual medical coach, all your data will be continually inputted and assimilated and fed back to you in terms of guidance. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we get the text part straight, it'll also be the entire medical literature pertaining to you mm -hmm. about a condition that you're at risk for or that you actually have and you're trying to manage better. Already we're seeing this for diabetes now, starting to emerge, but eventually it's gonna be in the next five years for your general health. And so you'll have this avatar that will communicate mm -hmm. with you on your phone or your smart speaker or whatever, mm -hmm. and I'll say, Alan, you know, you haven't slept right the last several days and you, everything indicates you know, you're at a much higher stress level. Yeah. And that's why we're seeing your blood pressure starting to get out of whack and, um, this is a and recommendation. And they notice it's like 11 o'clock, they spray I, I, some I, lavender, they I, I, play some seductive music. And well, it may, it may play your favorite <laughs> song, but it also might say, you know what, the reason is you just haven't been getting any exercise and you're not 
you, you really got to get back on track and be yeah. like your your conscience how trying to help you to stay healthy now why is that important because first of all it's not for everybody but just like your kind of voice assistant or, or your you know your daily life assistant to tell you to go to the airport or to the traffic's bad or whatever it's going to be for your health the the difference here is that this is about um, preventing a condition a dream that we've never fulfilled before mm -hmm. now we've had general prevention like don't smoke cigarettes or you know wear seat belts or things like that but we haven't had individualized prediction now yeah. we have these things called polygenic risk scores mm -hmm. and I can say this person has a much higher risk of heart disease or a much higher risk of colon cancer or whatever several conditions that are common we've got that now before you ever get it that's the whole key is that you're coached so you don't ever get a wheeze if you're at risk for asthma or you don't ever get a polyp if you're at risk for colon cancer and on and on yeah. so that is exciting but you know it's just the beginning stages we're at the nascent the fact that we can even ideate about it is yes. exciting yes but that's where we're heading so then let's let's see if we can then visualize this so then we have this constant stream of data that's coming from our bodies and our health that is likely from different things like the cameras on our devices that are able to like read our our our, our biometrics that way or other things like um, all the other just sensor suites in general um, wearables all different types of things then we have that that is constantly being fed into really strong cloud compute potential that has the entire medical corpus ideally this is the future hopefully entire medical corpus that's constantly seeing okay eric's current states compared to the corpuses of literature and dynamically making recommendations as a virtual medical coach for eric's optimal health trajectory so on this like tree of possibilities that exists we could get Eric to live until 96 years of age, but Eric needs to do these specific steps in order to get to that spot. Otherwise, if there is a bifurcating moment of not listening and getting that two hours of sleep instead of that eight like we asked, that they may slowly be shedding days and weeks off of that optimal lifespan. Yeah, yeah I don't know that it's gonna be lifespan changing, but it may be quality of life changing. Because mm. if you don't have one of these conditions that you are at risk for, that's just one less thing you have to deal with throughout your life. Uh, you know, whether you have to have stents for your arteries or whether you have to, you know, keep going more frequently for uh, yeah. uh, procedures. You know, I, we don't have evidence that we have transforming lifespan in store, but I think I mean, if you don't have, have an asthma attack ever in your life because it's preventable, wouldn't that be better than having to take daily inhalers and medic medicines and worrying about, you know, could that sort of thing? So we're talking really about quality of life, perhaps. Yeah. If we ever get to uh, beyond health span, if we ever get to lifespan, that would be a welcome thing. But, you know, I'm, I'm not um, trying to be too uh, bold in our expectations. I'd rather yeah. be setting things even what we're talking about here is quite ambitious day-to-day -day feeling in peak health yeah that yeah. you yeah, you preserve your health um, rather than having the years that you're around that you're suffering even more chronic conditions because if you're long around okay. if you're around long enough you're going to have some problems some conditions if we can minimize that and keep you uh, well preserved then you're probably going to be enjoying your life a lot more yeah and then Eric, why don't we ask you about those perverse incentives that currently exist? So the lack of inclusive stakeholding with physicians and patients is a major one. The amount of lobbyist money that's being poured into the pharmaceutical industry, it's tough because it takes so much money to make something that we hope augments health. And then if it's and then so hard to test it because it's so hard to control that single variable in such a complex piece of art like the body. What do we do for increasing inclusive stakeholding between physicians and patients, increasing empathy, and, and while simultaneously having a strong um, electronic health record? Is this something like 
we take the, the voice and then we parse that for text and then the text auto inputs it into the electronic health record so they don't have to do it. And then also on the like fake food sides as well is how do we have more inclusive stakeholding and less self-dealing? Yeah, well, firstly, um, what we do need to do is get back the human bond that is the essence of medicine. So the relationship between patients and doctors, patients and all clinicians, whether it be nurses, f physical therapists, pharmacists, I mean, you name it. But right now, that's fractured. It's eroded, seriously eroded. And it's been a steady demise over decades. And that's largely because of the big business of healthcare. And pharma pharmaceuticals is just one relatively small part of that story. Uh, so how do we get it back? And I think we can in the era of AI as it kicks in. You already mentioned one of many strategies, which is keyboard liberation. Keyboard liberation. <laughs> yeah, so it's basically using yeah. voice, the conversation, which is the, uh, 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 the most salient aspect of that, yeah. that interaction, and synthesizing the note from it. Turns out the notes you get from the voice conversation are far better than the notes that are currently in these electronic records. Interesting. Because those records are 80% cut and pasted from the prior note, mm. and that note is erroneous. And so what we do is just have a uh, perpetual transmission of erroneous notes. Whereas the conversation, which captures the real-time interaction, is essential because it, that, firstly, that is all archived. So Patients oftentimes, you know, they don't really, can't absorb everything when they're talking to a doctor because it's a lot's happening, it's about their body and they're all worried and, you know, it, it, oftentimes they may have their spouse with them or a, a, fa a family member and they still, it's hard to get it all absorbed. So they can have an archive of that conversation yeah. to, li to listen to if they want. There's no reason why they shouldn't. But also, more importantly, the synthesis of that note, the, the critical elements are then, as you say, speech to text. And very quickly, we've learned that within a small number of patients, for a given doctor, their voice, it captures it really well. And the notes are just excellent. And they're just gonna keep getting better, of course, because it's an autodidactic story. It just gets more accurate. And here, we want the patients to edit the notes, too, mm. because that'll just even add more mm -hmm. authenticity and accuracy. At any rate, so that part is starting to take off in different parts of the world, and mm -hmm. that's just one. There's so many other ways that AI, that's natural language processing, yeah. machine learning, but you've got AI to tee up a person's record, to go through the hundreds of pages of labs and path reports, if there are any, uh, scans, and all the other things that happen to that person or in their family history, their social history. You have that, a machine to do that for you to do that accurately and tee it up so you don't have to spend hours yeah. trying to sort through and miss a lot of stuff because you get distracted or because it's just so much stuff. Then you have, uh, of course, the ability to have the images interpreted, as we talked about, uh, through initially through a scan to not miss things, or the slides, or a skin lesion, or you know all sorts of things that, that machines are really good at that don't miss things that humans and experts can. So you have offloading to machines, you've got also the ability for patients taking more charge with their data. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, they might have sensors on, they may have their electronic record, and they may have their genome and their gut microbiome, and all of a sudden, they're getting feedback and they're getting more autonomy. They, there's a lot of things that are in medicine today they don't, we, are, we could do without a doctor diagnose a urinary tract infection, an ear infection, a skin rash, and the long, long list of common things that are not serious, they're not life-threatening, but they could be just uh, validated through algorithms. So patients can do themselves. Again, decompressing the load on clinicians. So we're gonna see all these things take hold. And one of the biggest longer term is that we will gut out hospitals. Because Whoa. the hospital is the biggest hit to the uh, health economy, mm. the staffing and the facilities, and that's a third of the 3.5, 3.6 trillion dollars in the U.S. a year. So, if we obviously we're not going to get rid of intensive care units or operating rooms or emergency rooms or fancy imaging equipment, but 
the regular hospital room would be better served in a patient's bedroom yeah. or even anywhere in their home or on the, go. on the go. The reason being is we can exquisitely monitor people today. And as soon as we get to the point of having that multimodal data getting properly processed, then we can say, you know what, it's safer to have the patient at home at a tiny fraction of the cost. Wouldn't that be great? So that's where some of the biggest changes we're going to see, they're pervasive. There isn't one specialty in medicine or primary care that isn't affected. We're talking about everything from paramedics to palliative care. Yeah. There isn't one walk of life or in the, in the whole um, life story from uh, in vitro fertilization all the way to end of life care that wouldn't be affected. So it's a very big impact like I've never seen sort yeah. of thing. Oof, ha. And it's so important for us to, to democratize the benefits widely, quickly, and also important for us to pursue this in a way that is ethically and morally righteous and, and also that, that is, we'll, we'll get to some more of these things, but also that is geopolitically collaborative. So let's, um, let's touch on this. You mentioned this, it was a big part of what you just said. We're architecting new data flows right now for the data to be structured in a way that can easily be readable and that can easily then have all different types of artificial intelligence uh, um, methodologies applied to it in order for us to understand what's actually going on within ourselves. So does a, does a future with, arch with these new architectures of data flows potentially look like ownership of our own data and then being able to do things like, almost in a sense, have a valve and be able to like open the valve and let my biometric data flow into uh, like scripts, for example, and have scripts be able to leverage my biometric data for research purposes. Right, well, this is a really big topic uh, about control and ownership of data uh, because the way it works today is that people don't own their data. They have to beg and grovel to get pieces of their data because it's distributed in many different places. First of all, there's not even a home for person sensor data or their genome or their, if in the future more and more their microbiome of their gut. And so there's environmental sensors. There's lots of things that we don't even collect and put in the medical record of today. But then each person often has many different d interactions with doctors of different places and different, even in the same city or town. And, and that data just sits at different places and is never collated. So one of the problems we have in the era of artificial intelligence is nobody has all their data unless they happen to be born in a health system and never left it and all of that's you know, aggregated perfectly well. That's pretty unusual. Plus, even that person doesn't have all their sensor data and their genome and whatnot. So we have, we're in flux right now where there's many modes of data and it's fragmented uh, and it's hard to get at it all. Some of it, if we're older, is a lot of it's on pa in paper, not even digitized. So we have a problem because inputs is basically what is the story here for AI. And you have limited inputs, then your output is not going to be is it's going to be compromised. It's not going to be as good as it can be. So, we are firstly um, not fessing up that we have a problem, uh, and we have to override this somehow or other. And then secondly, we have a security and privacy issue that's deep in this country. We don't have these um, uh, GDPR standards that Europe adopted. We're much more um, tolerant of hacking and, and cyber thievery and holding hostage health systems for their data. All these sorts of things that are just atrocious and we're doing very little to stop it. And also juxtaposed with what looks like to be a very collective approach of like the um, People's Republic of China. Yeah, well, like, you know, in Estonia, people own all their data. It sits on a blockchain type format and you make the call. Mm. Like you said, I want to open the valve to give my sensor data to this research program 
or to give this medical data to a doctor that I'm going to see or I trust, you make the call. And the reason why that's attractive, uh, and that model really was initiated there, is that when you have control of the data and it sits at the level of an individual or a family, then you don't have the cyber uh, hacking potential. If you talk to the gurus of cybersecurity, mm -hmm. they say, keep it in the smallest units as possible. Mm. The more it sits on big servers, the more it's a target because it turns out that the data of our health is far more valuable than our financial data. Mm. It turns out that it's at least 5x in the dark web or more uh, value because it's used for false medical claims in this country. Mm. It's used to get prescriptions like opiates. Mm -hmm. It's used for identity theft, medical identity theft. So Whoa. our medical data is really valuable. We're not protecting it enough. We don't aggregate it, it you know, it very well. And that needs a shakeup. That needs priority, and it hasn't gotten it yet. So, uh, you know, we, we can learn from other places um, and it's surprising how little attention's been paid to this. Okay, let's, um, let's touch on how you gave these examples of like, okay, Estonia is doing things a specific way, China's doing things another way, the United States, Europe, et cetera, doing things in different ways. Now, we also mentioned like the importance of democratizing these advancements in healthcare and making them accessible to people, being ethical as we do that. Something that I thought that was really interesting was that your, you had a recent post with uh, Kai Fu Lee about um, June Wang's iCarbonX and Jamie Haywood's patients like me. Right. And there was a order from the United States for iCarbonX to withdraw its funding and ownership of patients like me. Well, uh, they had to, yes, there, I, uh, through the Trump administration, there was a order of divestiture, yeah. whereby patients like me could not be owned by iCarbonX, a Chinese company, and they ultimately were, uh, after that piece was uh, published, they, they're, in, they're ready to close terms to be acquired by United Health in the U.S. because of this forced divestiture. Whoa. So this was a real um, a bad omen because um, iCarbon X beautifully was a great partnership with patients like me. They hadn't done anything wrong in terms of uh, uh, breach of data of any patients of the 700,000 people in patients like me. Uh, and the idea was that they were going to be like this voice medical coach. They were going. They they were working on that. That, that was to give them, uh, you know, a large cohort of people with diverse conditions, diverse uh, demographics, uh, with all the things that they're doing. So it was actually, um, uh, I think, uh, a bad sign of the times, which is in part why Kai Fu and I wrote that piece, because we want to see collaboration. This is an opportunity, we'll, we're, I don't know if we'll ever have it again. Mm -hmm. and, what, and, and not only that, but the Chinese-U.S. relationship is kind of at a nadir right now. Uh, a lot of tension, the trade war, and all sorts of uh, accusations of uh, scientists as spies. And I mean, it's, it's really the worst I've ever seen in, in my career. Meanwhile, but, we're all like friends, you know, <laughs> the, yeah, like we have friends in Beijing or Shanghai or whatever, and they have friends in New York and LA and stuff. Yeah, you know? so that's going on in the, in the <laughs> foreground, but in the background, we got some serious uh, concerns. Now, health is interestingly of mutual interest, and there's so yeah. much complementarity of what China has and what the U.S. has, and if we could work together, well, what about all the other countries around the world that could join in? But if we're if we're using the planet uh, inhabitant health as a goal, and yes, it's a big goal, and that could help improve relationships even outside of health between the countries. Um, so I haven't given up hope for this, but I hope that, uh, at the same time that we recognize that this point you're bringing up, this di forced divestiture, is going to uh, really lead to more polarity. It's going to escalate the tension rather than the opposite. So, um, you know, uh, it's really unfortunate that this has occurred. 
I'm hoping it's just a transient thing that we can get back on track. We, we outlined in the Nature Biotech uh, uh, article how we could go forward and with an open science, uh, open platform resource way and uh, have joint governance. And once we get started and develop this infrastructure yeah. of data yes. where it's federated learning. So this is a type of AI which is really another exciting subtype where you never take the data outside of that country or health system, hospital, doctor's mm. office. It's all machine trained. It's like at the edge instead of in the cloud. Mm -hmm. It's all done. And so you never have mm -hmm. to worry about breaches of privacy. And if we did that so that no country would have to worry about their data leaving or being um, stolen or, or hacked, Using this federated uh, type of AI, we, could, we couldn't even actually advance the concept, but now that is a, an alluring potential. It's something that deserves to be tried, at least in a pilot way. Yes, the importance of the United States and China to be able to cooperate and maximize flourishing for the rest of the planet together, especially with things like the Belt and Road Initiative coming up on the Eastern Hemisphere and just the United States and China being the top two economies on the planet, just that our way of actually being able to really more deeply spiritually work together um, is critical. It's one of the top most important things um, in the world and also within our ethos. And so that's why, you know, we're coming up on um, partnership uh, interviews and delivering a talk at Peking University in Beijing mm. in September. And I'm really looking forward to that. And it's just going to be one of the most critical things that happens in the next um, couple of decades is being able to figure that relationship out more effectively. All right, let's, um, let's make sure we talk about the heart. I think this is really important to talk about. The heart in our just the entire evolution of our planet and our bodies on this planet and then the organ systems within those bodies and then the heart specifically being such a beautiful organ that gives us a hundred thousand beats a day of, of being able to help us live and uh, help us survive. And so I'm just very spiritually tied to the heart. Like I really love it on a, <laughs> uh, just like a huge spiritual level. And, and I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on, on, on the heart and on a spiritual level about um, the importance of the heart? Well, you know, I've, that's my, been my career. Uh, you know, I, I got boarded as a cardiologist in 85, so it's now 34, 35 almost years. Um, I think it's uh, a phenomenal organ, the fact that this pump is, uh, is there for you, um, you know, every second, and um, giving you the nourishment of every cell in your body. Uh, essentially so yeah spiritually I mean that's why there's so much overlap with love and the heart and mm -hmm. you know I think there's no question about that connect and uh, you know I think that there are obviously every organ is important in the body uh, this is a central part of life um, so I can understand your spiritual correct connection to it I've been very uh, lucky to be able to work in this area of trying to preserve people's heart health. Uh, and it turns out, you know, it's oftentimes um, a mixed bag of genetics. So people do everything they can to take care of themselves and still wind up with tr heart trouble. And uh, it oftentimes is bad lifestyle as well. It's this kind of admixture of everything of nature and nurture. but. Um, you know, overall, we've made tremendous strides in heart health over the course of my career. Uh, in fact, that's why I got into it in the first place. I, I wasn't even planning on being a cardiologist, but I, I was so excited by what was happening when I was training in the early 80s uh, that it was clear that that was going to be a hot area to be in, and, and that was going to be um, an area that would be stimulating. And, and turns out it's been one that probably in many ways have outpaced other areas of medicine in terms of progress. Doesn't mean that we, we still have lots of heart disease, but you know, people dying of heart attacks today is much less than used to be the case. People 
having less heart damage. Um, many things are far better than they were. Uh, in fact, just to give you a quick uh, story on that, Alan, when I was um, training, if you had a heart attack, what we did was we, you know, gave you morphine for the pain and oxygen, and basically, you know, kind of prayed that you would get through it because we didn't have anything to stop a heart attack in its tracks. And so now, obviously, we, we do everything we can to restore the blood supply. And most people do have a restored blood supply. And people dying of heart attack is, you know, markedly, it's plummeted. So that used to be the most common cause of death, heart attack and heart disease. And now it's still important. But over time, you know, cancer is overtaking it. Um, and, you know, I think it's exciting to see the progress because, you know, we think about it, 30 years is a little, uh, almost like a little uh, drop in the bucket of time when you think about um, the universe. And to see that kind of progress in a short time is, is relatively astounding. Yes. Eric, would you say that we all come from the same source? Uh, you know, I'm not a real uh, kind of religious person, so I don't know. I, 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 if you talk about source of evolution, yeah, I could get into that. But, you know, I really yeah. don't. I, yes. Uh, but as far as, you know, did God create man and all that, I don't know. I, I, mm -hmm. I, um, but yeah. all coming from the same source of evolution. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I am a strong believer in that. Yeah. That principle that we evolve from, you know, uh, organisms of lesser mm -hmm. um, uh, and complexity and we're continuing to evolve albeit perhaps uh, you know at a different pace but yeah no I that I would agree and and let's go know. backwards far enough then so then if we go from yeah from humans to single cell organisms to the, to the, to the initial um, root of evolution on this planet and the star systems and then what we hypothesize is this Big Bang what about prior to that? Does this feel like it's just one big creation that's occurred and it's like a big, beautiful painting with different strokes <laughs> and a big symphony of different notes? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's something I think about um, and it's hard to know. It's just, you know, we're here for a limited time and we can be, you know, quite introspective about it, but these are some of the unknowns. Um, I, I wish I had an answer for you. And then what do you think about how lots of uh, indigenous wisdom around the world is saying that our disconnection from nature, our disconnection from this origin story of ours, is the reason why we have so many of the issues? Yeah, uh, well, you know, that's like the religious wars and, you know, the whole idea. Um, of this um, disbelief, anti-science, you know, that the evolution of man uh, and our whole, of our biology is somehow, uh, it, it didn't occur. I mean, I have a hard time with that because I think that particularly uh, the climate right now uh, of anti-science with the idea that you know, evolution shouldn't be taught in schools and that sort of thing, it, it, that really gets me uh, pretty riled up. So, uh, you know, I think that um, this is an area where, just like the diet, there's a lot of tribalism, you know, about people that are really big on, let's say, ketogenic diet and people are really big on this or that. I mean, Intermittent we've had, fasting. We, we have a lot of divisiveness and uh, we don't really have tolerance or belief in where there's tr hard scientific proof. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's any question about the, if you trace evolutionary biology, you know, wh where we came from. But, you know, there's people that uh, negate that, uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult area. You know, the importance of nuance, the importance of multivariability, of humility, of compassion, of having really good thought-provoking conversations, having good dialectic. All right. And how about then, what would you say is the teleology of this whole human experiment? <laughs> 
Well, these are pretty deep questions, <laughs> uh, which I didn't, none of these recent ones had I anticipated. Uh, you know, I, 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 just kind of like the meaning of life, and you know, um, it's it's a, it's it's tough to. All I know is that you know I try to have uh, uh, input in the time, the short time I'm around, to try to make a difference. Um, to try to help people, uh, to try to connect deeply with my family, um, who I'm lucky enough to have all close together here in, in San Diego. And, you know, I, it's sometimes uh, beyond that, it's hard, you know, I, I contemplate it. I'm sure a lot of people do. Um, you know, it, that whole, having seen so many people who were alive one second and dead the next, it gives you a different sense about life and how yeah. short it can be and how sudden you can be not there. Um, and that's one thing I, in medicine, it, it's somewhat unique, um, that you, the evanescence of life. Yes. Um, and, you know, it, it, to me, it, that and the fact that you know I've had so much of a burden of disease among my family, my parents and relatives, it even gave me more motivation to try to make the best of each day. Um, but I still know that however many years that I get to be on this side of the, the, the dirt, that you know what, it's a small, tiny, tiny thing in the big picture. And even whatever you can, have as a that you added to our to our uh, species, if you will, to mm -hmm. our planet, yeah. to our community, whatever you want to call it, that you can only go so far. You know, you you kind of uh, the <laughs> the ability to make substantive changes is a uh, tall order. Uh, it's probably yeah. impossible. You chip away at it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you came to the planet with a North Star, with <laughs> with with an ideal goal and mission that you wanted to achieve here and that you're fulfilling that? No, I, I, that's probably too lofty. Um, <laughs> in fact, I know it's too lofty. No, I, I think it's really more that, um, you know, I when I was a kid, I watched a lot of my relatives die. I remember, you know, being a kid and going to various funerals and then I saw my parents die at a young age. And, uh, you know, I had a higher appreciation for if you're lucky enough to be here, just to be here, you know, less to do something. And then I was just lucky enough to have the ability to go to uh, get the right education and pursue um, a, a path that I could feel like this, I'm aligned, I'm, I'm excited, I'm passionate about what I do. and. I'm, I'm lucky enough to feel a kind of uh, spurts of creativity and being able to uh, inspire other people. So I'm lucky enough to have a great team here that I get to work with and, and we try to do the same, reverberate our uh, work and ideas more broadly. So I, I feel exceptionally lucky. Um, but a lot of that happens by accident. You know, it, 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 some of it is setting goals, but a lot of it is, you know, you're just lucky to wind up with people who are simpatico, who are, you know, kind of the same, what drives them, what makes them tick. There's a lot of commonality, and that makes it happen. Doesn't it ever feel like those synchronicities that are lining up in your trajectory of achieving your goals are potentially there for a reason? Maybe as lessons or as as experiences to help you level up. Well, you know, it, it's it's it isn't clear. You know, I, oftentimes what I'll do is I'll say, you know, we we we, we got to do this. This is a big thing, and uh, sometimes it'll work and we'll get there. Uh, other times, you know, we. I remember, you know, when I was back in Cleveland and I started a new medical school. There hadn't been one in 26 years. And it was really difficult yeah. because 
uh, where I worked at Cleveland Clinic, there was no degree granting authority, so we couldn't start a medical school you know, like that. Yeah. And we had to work with the Case Western in town, which is the university, and they already had a health system, and the last thing they wanted was another medical school in town, and it basically had like, taken down the Berlin Wall and we were able to do it and we started this medical school it was the first one in 26 years in the united states um now well, that took a couple of years of dedicated effort I, i'm really yeah. proud of that we were able to do it so that's the kind of thing where if you just keep you know working on it uh, and you get can, you have to convince a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, take down what was walls of hostility um, you almost like be a shuttle uh, ambassador. Uh, um, it, you, that something that is worth it. It's worth it because it'll train generations of, of um, doctors in the future. Now, there's been certainly many things you know I'll go after, and it, they'll be a failure. They'll, they'll never materialize too. So, you know, the, you have to offset if you don't try. The, what I've learned though, and this happened more over the course of a career is don't do little things. I mean, it isn't worth mm -hmm. the energy. Put, you know, put your, put your resources, your time into things that are, are transformative potentially. And transcend. Yeah, us. yeah, because otherwise, if you're just trying to do incremental stuff, it's usually, you're gonna wind up putting a lot of time into that and it really isn't gonna be worth it. And you're better, better off to fail when it's something, you know, major. Uh, because at least you gave it a shot. And, yeah. and you know what, a lot of those times you're gonna succeed, particularly if you get to work with people. You, you can't, it's very hard to do this alone, and, you're, totally. and you really gotta get um, you know, a kind of team collaborative approach, but if you do that and you set big goals um, that some people might say are beyond reach, unattainable, mm -hmm. impossible even, those are probably the best goals. Yep. As, as long as they're sound, as long as there's you know unmet need and and a real uh, purpose, those are the ones that I like to do. Likewise, so beautifully said. And then, how about if you were to have the ability to make uh, augmentations right now to ba to children that are being born into the world? Let's say it's even like your children that are being born into the world, and you have the ability to make. Uh, augmentations to the child being born. What area of their development would you choose to augment first? Yeah, I, I don't think that w I'd want to go there to augmentation. You, I, I still you know? would be into nature, but you know, I I had like, with genetic engineering and trying to figure out exactly which which ways that we can augment metabolism or intelligence. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm yeah. not, I think there's a big ethical quandary with that. Yeah. Because there's no real, you know, it's a gray zone. You know, what are you going to do, make more athletic, more intelligent, and more what, you know, more what? We've kind of been doing that, though, over the years of evolution. We ourselves have been <laughs> genetically pairing for fitness in terms of intelligence or athletics or strength or metabolism or all different well, types but, of things. But now it's different because now we have these powerful tools like genome editing. And uh, we watch the reckless use of that in China um, where they're basically... Um, the uh, fellow, uh, he, Janicki, was um, getting couples with uh, the father with HIV and saying that we could make sure that the baby, will we'll CRISPR the babies uh, at the embryo state so that the baby doesn't have to worry about getting HIV. Well, you guess what? That wasn't going to happen anyway. You didn't need CRISPR. And so it basically, and the, and the genome editing part, was so reckless because there's all sorts of things that can happen outside of the zone of editing, no less in the zone that you're trying to edit of a genome. So that was a disaster. And that was the first foray of an embryo. But this is a powerful tool which has potentially lots of side effects and it shouldn't be augmenting at the embryo level, in my view. It, what it should be doing is trying to treat diseases Eradicate that we don't have. disease. Yeah, that's let's say different. that one's. But that that's, let's say that that's already, different than augmenting. Well, let's say eradication of disease is already awesome. We're all already on board for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Across the planet. Now we have the augmentation side of things. 
Yeah, well, you know, I look at augmentation as having a baby uh, in, in an infertile couple. That's augmenting. Mm -hmm. That's augmenting their family. Mm -hmm. I had my granddaughter was an IVF baby, and I still feel good. That is a miracle. Yeah. And she's really healthy. She's just like 15 months old. And uh, it was secondary infertility because my daughter had already had a healthy uh, boy. But um, I still think that's extraordinary. But to manipulate that embryo further, besides just being able to get an embryo mm -hmm. that's viable and to term pregnancy, you know, I, it's really dicey. I mean, we IVF now is 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 still got lots of failures, and the, the it's a tremendous expense. It's uh, often, you know, couples go through multiple rounds. There's all sorts of hormonal injections. Until you see somebody having to go through this, you have no idea how complicated and tough it is. Yeah. And uh, this is something that, here we're talking about augmenting, we can't even get, you know, just a simple, let's mm -hmm. just have a, a, a natural baby, you know, that is different than we're going to start doing genome editing of that embryo. So I, I'm not into that, uh, you know. Interesting. I, I, I think that... I wonder if your children, 50 years from now, yeah. uh, and their children, 50 years from now, will say that, I can't believe that you weren't genome editing uh, <laughs> back then. Because, because in 50 years, it seems to be the trajectory is moving to that to be a norm. Very similarly to how we're slaughtering billions of animals for food versus growing clean meat, children, again, will be like, I can't believe you were doing that. Back well, you, you know, you could be right uh, that there will be more, there will be some use at the embryo level that, you know, get out these genes that would uh, cause risk of cancer yeah. or Alzheimer's or, you know, whatever disease that's possible. I, I, if it's preventing significant diseases, I, I, I could see that. But augmenting, I see it as artificial augmentation whereby you know, instead of having cosmetic surgery to look pretty, now we're, co now we're actually going in to human life. And remember, any transmit, anything that we're doing there is transmittable. So we're changing the species, all right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and so this Huge is, deal. Now, we're, now we're playing with, not fire, we're playing, playing with, with God. We're, we're playing with, with the human genome yeah. and the future of the species. So if, you, if you're gonna be doing that and you're gonna be transmitting that, it better be for something damn good. And, you know, I think diseases, here, uh, yeah. okay, of if they're serious diseases yeah. and you know it and you don't have side effects, uh, uh, absolutely. If you want, if you want to get to somebody more intelligent, you know what? Well, we're trying to solve these grand physics challenges. <laughs> on Earth. Yeah, well, I, see, I, I, I have a real different solution than you on this. I actually think the human mind is, is uh, the talent that we have in general is extraordinary. I, 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 meet, I meet people who are brilliant all the time and you know far smarter than I'll ever be and ever was and you know I think and we see young people coming up. I, we have like high school interns spend the it's summer here huge, and yeah. they make me feel like a complete moron. You know they're just incredible. Yeah. So I don't worry about the intellect at all. And I don't worry about athletics because we already have hero worship of sports. I don't see any good rationale for the augmentation side you're bringing up. I, I, I'm keen on the disease burden thing, if we can do that. But that's a big if. Big if. And, you know, um, right now we're talking about rare diseases, not yeah. common diseases. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. Okay, maybe in another uh, latter conversation, we can unpack some of the other potential uh, conversational points around this. Let's let's um, visit the last couple um, questions, which is, Eric, do you think that we're in a simulation? A simulation? Mm, I don't know about that. I, I think we're in a real a reality zone, and. Um, I mean, you don't want to treat it like a simulation. You get one chance. You, you know, you, if you if you think of it as a simulation, then that's probably um, that's probably not ideal. It doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. If you see it as a simulation, you can see it as a game, and it's so important for you to achieve your mission and your goals here. So it can actually, in ways, also maybe even excite you more to achieve your divine purpose. By, by viewing it in that way. So it doesn't necessarily have to be exclusive from 
being serious about life. Uh, I'll, I'll take your point. That's a you know that's your perspective. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Hmm. Uh, I think love of uh, another human being is probably what I would put up there. Um, you know, I think, and of course, not just one, but uh, 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 there's a, a real dearth of that. And it's why we have so much, you know, divisiveness and wars. And but uh, you know, at, at a at a human level, that bond for to each other, to me, is is beauty. It's more beautiful than the most beautiful beach or or place on earth, nature. Um, we don't have enough of it, and when you're in touch with it, you say, "Well, how could it be better than that?" Mm. So that's what I see as the pinnacle of uh, of beauty. We can carry that love with us on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, through our breath, through our gratitude, through our connection to the planet, to the ecosystem that sustains us connection to each other to yeah no you're right intimacy. I mean if we had love and we if it got expressed in how we take care of our planet we'd be a whole lot better off than we are right now so yeah I mean if we could just get that um, you know to be expressed in many other ways it'd be great we don't have enough of it just to each other yeah. no less to get it to be um, reflected in, in our walk of life so yeah I agree with you <sighs> Eric this has been such a wonderful conversation, <laughs> really enlightening. Thank you. Well, thank you. You made me think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Also, check out the links in the bio below to Eric's profile page on Scripps, his Wikipedia, his Twitter, and check out his new book, Deep Medicine How AI Can Make Healthcare Human Again. That link is in the bio. Check that out. And have more conversations with your friends, your families, coworkers, people online on social media about deep medicine, about these subjects that we were talking about today. Talk more about it and try and figure out how we're going to maximize our prosperity through that age. Also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations, the spiritual leaders around the world that you believe in. Support them. Help them grow. Support simulation. Our links are below. Help us grow as well. Our PayPal, Patreon, cryptocurrency links are down there. You can design cool merch and get paid. All different kinds of things. And also, go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. That's okay. a wrap, Eric. All right. That was good. so fun. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, good Thank questions. You. Tough you. ones.